Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm here to talk to you about site reliability engineering for Kubernetes. My name's Tammy bryant Dito, and you can catch me on Twitter, Tammy X Bryant. Right now, I work at Gremlin as a principal site reliability engineer, where I focus on primarily failure injection. So injecting um, failure on purpose to be able to uncover issues. And that's through a lot of practicing chaos engineering. Prior to this, I worked at Dropbox as a site reliability engineering manager, where I also did a lot of chaos engineering to ensure that we could keep our systems up and running. And I looked after the databases systems, as well as the uh, block storage, and also a few other services too, Kafka, um, developer tools, lots of interesting things over the years. Today, I wanted to share with you some really interesting data and research that I did. So something that I think is really important as a site reliability engineer is to look at what's already happened, look at the common failure modes that exist, take a step back, look at all of that data before you come up with your plan for what you're going to do with your system to make sure that it's reliable. So I'm a very data-driven person, love metrics, love being able to understand the topic before making a decision. It's really important to me to gather all the facts and the evidence. You'll find a lot of site reliability engineers with many years of experience do the same thing. Sometimes they'll say it's a little bit like being a detective. Um, you know, when we do blameless postmortems, which I'm sure you've heard about, we have a full like timestamp history of everything that ever happened during an incident, you know, minute by minute, sometimes even more granular than that. So what is this data right here that I'm showing you? This is the data of all of the publicly reported outages related to Kubernetes that you can find on the internet. So what I did here is I broke them down by different categories. So you can see here that 25% of the publicly reported outages are CPU related, 25% are black hole, which means unavailable node, unavailable pod. And then when we look at other areas, what are the other top common issues? Shutdown, so shutdown of nodes or pods, 15, uh, just a little over 15%. DNS is also big, 13.6%, latency, 11.4%, and then some smaller ones around memory, disk at an even 23 and security at 4.5%. So that's how it breaks down when you look at all of the data reported about how Kubernetes can fail. These are the different types of ways it fails. And often, like, this is different than you expect. I didn't expect to see black hole and CPU as the top issues related to Kubernetes. I thought maybe actually shutdown would be one of the top issues. So let's look at then some real stories of these outages. After I gather the facts, the data, and look at those metrics at a high level, I like to dig into the detail and understand what's actually happened. So this um, illustration here is actually uh, a piece of a story from an outage that was publicly reported by Target. So Target had a huge Kubernetes outage, which actually was completely related to CPU and just having too much CPU load. It was related to Kubernetes and Kafka. So they were running Kafka sidecars to be able to ship logs from all of the Kubernetes nodes and then be able to gather all that data, be able to make sure that systems were running as expected. But what happened was um, all of the nodes woke up at the same time across all of their, um, all of the sidecars, the Kafka sidecars woke up at the same time across the nodes. This then made the nodes think that they were unhealthy, too much CPU, which led to a series of these nodes being replaced with healthy nodes that then also had too much CPU. And you can see that this becomes like a vicious cycle of more and more nodes being spun up. During the course of this outage, over 40,000 nodes were created for Kubernetes, which is like huge scale, the amount of servers that needed to be spun up and then were spun down. Just a lot of thrashing of resources. So that's one big issue. The other thing that I like to do is break it down by cloud provider. Something that I've learned as an SRE is you know, yeah, it's helpful to look at your data set and understand it and look at what the biggest problems are. I really like to use the Pareto principle, 80-20 rule, and understand where I should focus my efforts um, because you don't want to be doing pointless work or long tail work first. Uh, some people like to do that. They call it low hanging fruit. I call it like long tail, like not as useful work. I'd rather do like, you know, give me the, the really important work, the top 20% of issues that cause 80% of the problems. That's usually how it goes. 
So when we look at different cloud providers and how uh, many outages were reported, you can see here that the majority of outages were actually reported related to AWS. This is normal, makes a lot of sense because most people run Kubernetes on AWS. The next most common is GKE, so Google's uh, platform uh, to run Kubernetes on-prem and Azure. Azure has AKS, also a few people were running their own Kubernetes from scratch. AWS also has their managed service called EKS, and then folks also manage Kubernetes from scratch on that platform. So that's you know kind of helpful, but pretty much what we would expect, right? If we had a hypothesis of most commonly reported outages based on cloud provider, we'd probably say AWS. So let's look into it in even more detail. Let's take, take a step further. This data here shows us the outages broken down um, just related to AWS outages. So we're only looking at data for AWS related Kubernetes outages. You can see here, this is a little bit different, right? To our first chart that we saw where it was 25% even split between CPU and black hole. Now you can see that with AWS, CPU actually is an even bigger issue. So CPU is actually 32% of the problems reported when running Kubernetes clusters at scale on AWS. And then black hole is 28%. So this means, well, okay, that's really interesting. You can also see there are no security reported issues. Latency is actually a bit higher, 16%. You know, disk and memory is still pretty low. DNS is still kind of high at 12%. But it makes me then go, okay, I probably need to focus a lot of my efforts definitely on CPU, but shutdown is only 4%, so that's very low. So then when we look at that, the next thing that I'll do as a site reliability engineer is want to dive into that detail even further. This is a common theme of how we do this. So when I do dive into when I do dive into that CPU data and understand what are the different buckets that I could categorize these CPU related outages on AWS for Kubernetes into, these are the three buckets. So they all fit into these buckets. The first one is high CPU. That's the example that we talked about in that target incident where CPU was spiking, end up in like all these nodes coming up, they were unhealthy, more and more unhealthy nodes, causes an outage. CPU throttling is the second bucket. This means that there's actually something stopping the CPU from spiking and it'll say, I've already maxed out, even though say, for example, it only got to 50% CPU and then it spins up more nodes, more clusters. So you're still going through the same issue really as high CPU, but it's related to configuration being set that you know maybe you can only go to a certain amount of CPU and then it cuts you off and you need more nodes. And the third one is auto scaling by CPU. A lot of folks seem to believe, you know, cool, like I'm on AWS, I'm using auto scaling, everything's gonna be good. Like this isn't true. Um, so it's like a, you know, a, a kind of a myth. You wanna make sure that your team has set up auto scaling correctly. So there's a lot of configuration elements that really need to be uh, tuned to be correct. If you think about this back in the, the old days when we were tuning like databases or our hardware, the kernel, you know, you needed to change a lot of Linux parameters to make sure that everything ran perfectly. This is still the same in the world of auto scaling. You need to make sure that you set it. It's usually based on CPU. That's the most common way that you'll auto scale. You can actually choose the amount. So like, at what point do I want to kick in auto scaling? CPU has to reach a certain threshold. How long does it take for it to auto scale? Is it minutes with my cluster? Is it hours? What if it's multiple clusters? And then after CPU goes back down, does my cluster successfully and healthily go back to the previous state that it was at? Those are all really important questions. So now let's look at the data for Google Cloud. So with Google Cloud, there was only ever outages reported about GKE. And so if we look at that data, you can see here we have also a very different view compared to AWS and compared to our all cloud providers chart. We can see here that actually black hole is the biggest issue when you're running Kubernetes on GKE, Google's Kubernetes platform. Black hole is, you know, yeah, my node is unavailable, my pod is unavailable, something is unreachable. It's kind of like sending traffic to nowhere. Um, that's the idea of it. And shutdown was the second highest, which is really different too, right? Notice that there are no CPU related outages for Google Cloud. So if I was running Kubernetes on Google Cloud, I wouldn't prioritize that. I would actually prioritize looking at unavailability first, and then I would prioritize looking at shutdown. And 
My original hypothesis was that shutdown would be the highest, but it's, it's only like second highest on Google Cloud. When you're doing shutdown related reliability work, a lot of this too is about if I shut down a pod, how long does it take to come back cleanly? If I shut it down, does my system still work as expected? For example, if I have a payment service and I only have one payment pod, if I shut down that payment pod, does that mean no one can process payments at all during that period? Or do I have a secondary payment pod that is usable in that period? That means my customers can still be serviced. Um, this is like redundancy. The idea here with, with pods, we want to make sure that we have the right amount of pods running at all times so that we don't end up having an outage just because a pod gets shut down, which is a simple thing and it could totally happen all the time, right? Pods get rebooted, they need to shut down, they might just um, die, be removed, and then a new one comes back. But we want to understand how long does it take? if it shuts down? How long does it take to come back if it shuts down? What if a whole node shuts down? Have I evenly distributed my pods and containers across my nodes if I have like two nodes? Sometimes I'll see folks are only running one pod on one node and they don't have a redundant pod on the other node, a, a replica of that. So that becomes a really difficult situation, not a good place to be, but that's the sort of things you wanna look at there. This is Azure's data, it was 100% related to shutdown. So if you're running Kubernetes on Azure, there was a lot of reported problems around nodes shutting down and not coming back, pods shutting down and not coming back. And just that was 100% the main issue. So the most important place to focus. The reason I love looking into this data is you learn a lot of things and often it's not what you expect and sometimes it is. After I've looked at all of that data, the thing that I recommend um, doing next as a site reliability engineer is taking a step back, pop the stack and create a reliability plan for your team to work together towards. So for me, this is all about how, when, what, why and who uh, related to building our really reliable company, making sure that our customers can always be serviced, making sure there are no outages. At the bottom layer, there are tactics so these are the tactical actions and steps that we need to take. And actually, this is like a huge part of the work, right? Because it could be, we need to make sure we set auto scaling configuration to be exactly this percentage. We need to make sure that we can monitor our system well and have observability. We need to make sure we proactively inject failure to test that our configuration is set up correctly because we don't want to get bit you know, in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. because we just didn't set something right or maybe someone was tired and they changed the configuration at 2 a.m. for a different incident and now it's all busted that nobody knows. I've definitely seen that happen before. Um, you need to have like good auditing around configuration to prevent that as a SRE. Then next up, we want to look at our strategic goals. What are we really trying to achieve? Like if we think back to the Pareto principle, what's the most important thing that we need to do when we're looking at our system and caring for our system? And often the best way to figure this out is to ask two questions. One, what are your top five most critical systems or services that you need to keep reliable? That's my favorite question to ask ever. Usually people can't tell me what the answer is and that's already a bit of a red flag. Like, All right, let's figure that out. The next question is, do we have SLOs and SLIs for those top five critical systems? Because that enables us to understand how we measure their reliability. So this is the service level objectives and service level indicators. Then after that, we want to figure out our mission. You know, is it important to us to service customers 24-7 or is it really important for us to service customers perfectly on Monday mornings at this in this time window when that's when we know all of our customers log into our system on Monday morning? It's like our huge spike in traffic. These are things that SREs think about a lot, like when are your peak windows and when do you make, need to make sure that you're scaled up correctly to be able to service the needs during those peak windows? Because, you know, Saturday morning might not be a big issue for you and you might not have many customers, but Monday morning could be really important for you. Then vision. Where do we want to be in five years in terms of our site reliability engineering practice? Not just for Kubernetes, um, but for any new technology that we're using what do we want to say to everyone to do before they roll out a new technology or migrate to a new cloud provider or go multi-cloud? You can take these practices and you can apply that to everything. Um, and then lastly, what do we value? You know, for me, a lot of what I value is encouraging the team to be curious, encouraging them to always improve, encouraging them to have blameless postmortems when things go wrong and encourage, encouraging them to inject failure on purpose so that being more proactive instead of reactive. 
and also encourage them to avoid doing pointless work. So focus on that top 20% of issues that cause 80% of the problems. Thank you so much. And we'd also like to make a donation on your behalf um, in an act of paying it forward and helping with the community. So if you go to gremlin.com slash CTO dash connection, uh, you'll be able to make a donation to Code 2040, Black Girls Code or Charity Water. Thank you so much for having me. If you have any questions, you can just reach out to me on Twitter, Tammy X Bryant. Thank you so much.